Ah, hello, Cusick. Kind of. Thank you. Have a seat. Thank you. How are you? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm alright. Uh, I'm a bit nervous though, as you yeah. might expect. Yeah, that's expected. But hopefully, uh, you'll enjoy this interview as much as we will enjoy delivering it. Okay, so we'll get started then. Our first question will be um, tell me about your EPQ. Okay. Um, so I did my EPQ on Parkinson's disease. So um, I sort of evaluated what the best treatment uh, for it is. And I chose drug therapy, um, deep brain stimulation, and music therapy uh, as my treatments. And then sort of evaluated which one would be the best treatment for Parkinson's um, in, in managing the symptoms uh, over a long period of time. So, so, I, so I worked out that music therapy would be um, the most uh, effective treatment because uh, as opposed to drug treatments such as dopamine, uh, such as the dopamine precursor, levodopa, um, and other dopamine antagonists which can't be used that one in the long term. I feel like music therapy can, um, and I feel like DBS um, is so restrictive in terms of which uh, patients can use it. Um, so that's why I chose uh, music therapy. And, um, the sort of skills that my EBQ uh, had led me to gain sort of um, really uh, helped me develop my organisation skills, time management, um, as well as my um, as well as my, uh, um, my my knowledge on research articles and things like that, which I'm going to have to get to with at university. Yeah, so uh, very very good that you've done a research project, and obviously it does bring up skills which you'll be using in any university you go to. So you mentioned you thought that music therapy is the best therapy. Can you tell me why music therapy helps with Parkinson's? Right, so so music therapy um, is something that's really new, um, something that's not much research about. But um, what we just think that music therapy does. So so what it actually is is you sort of um, make the uh, make the Parkinson's disease patient uh, do like like percussive taps, maybe uh, tap their feet to music, and um, that really helps them. Uh, I get some movement done, and sometimes I can alleviate symptoms. So there are certain like temporal circuits um, in the brain uh, which are used well, when music is played, and in Parkinson's where the basic ganglia sort of goes wrong. Um, uh, I guess sort of uh, neuroplasticity happens where instead of the basic ganglia circuit, which uh, which normally works, instead of the brain uses the temporal circuit to sort of bypass the sort of um, uh, broken connection of neurons. Uh, I'm not really sure um, about the specifics of it. Um, as I said, it's a rather new field and not much uh, research has been done into it. But, um, but from the clinical trials that I've, I've seen, um, there is some uh, benefit of music therapy. But the other uh, clinical trials do disagree with music. So it's quite a new treatment. Yeah. From your EPQ, it's said that you have quite a firm interest in neurology. So let me pose a question to you now. So, how would you estimate? The number of neurons in a human brain. Right. Uh, the number of neurons in the brain. Is it alright if I use pen and paper for this? Yes, I'm just so. Alright. So, uh, how about you estimate it? Okay, so let me assume that the brain is uh, like a cube. Uh, and just by taking measurements from my head, um, I, I mean, my head is maybe about. 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters, but um, because there's the skull and other things, I'm guessing the actual brain is maybe uh, 15 by 15 by 15 uh, centimeters cubed. Um, so, what I'm planning to do is I'm trying to work out the volume of a single neuron and then work out the volume of the brain and then divide by divide the volume of the brain by the volume of one neuron. Work out the number of neurons. Um, I think volume is best than mass because it's a bit easier to estimate. Mm -hmm. um, so 15 by 15 by 15 is. Uh, 3,225 3, centimeters cubed. Um, and the volume of a neuron, okay, I'll assume a neuron is, uh, is just. Do you think it's realistic to estimate your brain as a cube? Probably, uh, probably not. It's, it's more 
It's more a sphere, it kind of is. Half sphere, right? Yeah. So, what's the formula for the polynomial sphere? Uh, it's 4 over 3 pi r cubed. Yeah, so you can use 2 thirds pi r cubed, so pi can right. actually be 3. Okay. So, the 2 thirds pi, so that's just 2 r cubed. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think that's a letter still. Um, but R in this case would be 15, would be 7.5. So, okay. Okay. So, if we use a calculator for this? Um, so, try and estimate this. 7.5, you can, oh, okay. Fine. You can uh, round. Okay, I'll, I'll round it up to 8. Okay. So, it's 2 times 2 to the 9. Just 2 to the 10. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it to that. Okay, what's. Uh, you can estimate 8 cubed. 8 squared is 64, so 64 times 8 is around. Uh, that's around, so let's say, 500? Yeah, 500, so 2 times 500,000. Okay, I found it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and now for the one with one neuron, mm -hmm. uh, assuming it's just uh, a neuron which connects from A to B, so not like a glue cell or anything else. Um, I'm assuming it's a cylinder, um, and let's say the radius, okay, let's say the diameter is one micrometer. Uh, I'm not sure if that's realistic or not, but at least it's an estimate. So how, how, how thick do you reckon a cell membrane is? A cell membrane, it's just, well, a cell membrane is, is well, a phospholipid bilayer, mm -hmm. so it's just uh, however long the fatty acid chains are, uh, and it's two of them. So, um, maybe 10 to the, um, 10 to the minus, uh, minus eight. So what's the rough, um, that I asking? About 10 to the minus 10. Yeah. So how, how many atoms across is each fatty acid roughly? Maybe 20. Yeah, 20. So 20 times 10 to the minus 10, you've got two of that, so 40 times 10 to the minus 10. Yeah. Oh, right, okay, yeah. So that's 4 times 10 to the minus 9. Uh, so roughly half, um, well, 5 uh, nanometers. Yeah, that's 5 nanometers. Yeah. Right. And there's a cell, a cell's mm -hmm. huge compared to that. Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh, well, well, it's definitely like a thousand times bigger than. So, um, if a if a cell membrane is five nanometers, you think one micrometer is less than small estimate? Um, so a nanometer and micrometer are a thousand apart. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think I think that's pretty reasonable. Yeah, yeah so it, it is a completely reasonable estimate. So you can work with that. Okay. Uh, and as for the length of the neuron, I'll assume that it's one one centimeter on average. So okay. lots of different neurons in the brain. Okay. So I'll assume it's a cylinder. So that's the formula for the volume is pi r cubed h. Um, you mean pi r squared h? Oh yeah, so pi r, pi r squared mm -hmm. h, yeah. So I assume pi is 3. Uh, the radius is so 0.5 minus squared. Um, one second is 10 to the minus 2 meters. So I'm, I'm converting everything to meters. Yep. Um, that's so I got uh, uh, so in standard form I got um, I got seven point five times ten to the uh, times ten to the minus fifteen uh, meters cubed. So roughly one times ten to the minus fourteen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and one of the brain, so that's a thousand centimeters cubed. So that's uh, so it's divided by a million. Uh, so it's ten to the minus three meters cubed. Mm -hmm. um, and now if I do ten to the minus three over ten to the minus fourteen, I get ten to the eleven, yeah. which is uh, so a million, a billion, a hundred billion. Yeah, it's full on a hundred billion. Really. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> What's okay. Oh, okay. That's that's a good but 
So really good there. So we'll move on to our next question. Um, so we can consider humans uh, in comparison to other animals like cats and dogs to be more sort of intelligent. Uh, yeah. In the case that we can, in the sense that we can, you know, plan more, uh, store memory. Um, why do you think that is? Right. Um, so the difference between us and cats in terms of intelligence. Yeah, so other animals like cats and dogs. Well, I think the main reason is the difference in our brains. Uh, I mean, the brain is like um, the main uh, coordinating organ in the body, and, so, and it's responsible for you perceiving the world around us. So maybe differences in our... Um, I'm not sure what the part of the brain for you think. The prefrontal cortex and the sort of cortex areas in us is a lot more developed, which allows us to have uh, like higher level processing. What do you mean by a lot more developed? So it might be that the number of neurons in that particular area um, is just a lot greater. So a higher neuron density, yeah. Yeah. Um, it might be that. Uh, what are Maybe that there are more, uh, I mean, maybe more myelination of particular neurons which help be in a faster faster. reduction. Yeah. Um, maybe more connections as opposed to just neuron density. Could be. Um, do you think the size of a brain has a part to play? Uh, I feel like it, it might have a part to play. So I know that our brains are definitely bigger than cats' brains, but I don't think that necessarily means we're more intelligent. So if you think about maybe elephant, yeah, elephants are massive, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. you can't say they're more intelligent. Yeah, they're still quite intelligent. Though. Yeah. Good. So I want to move on to uh, focus on cats and mentioned cats. So when cats fall from a height, so the proportion of the height uh, to the body to their sort of body size, um, they can fall from a much greater height. But in proportion, for example, if I if I fell from the top floor, uh, I probably wouldn't do very well. So why do you think there's a difference there? Okay. Um, so why cats can sort of fall greater okay. Um, okay, so I'm wondering what actually makes a difference. And sort of the impact you feel when you hit the ground. Yeah. Um, I mean, the the height you fall from uh, is a factor, but I, I think I think it's a factor because if you fall from a great distance, you hit the ground harder and faster. Mm -hmm. So cats must have a way to sort of reduce their impact uh, to make to make to make sure that they land uh, less hard and less fast. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so could it be that they sort of like increase drag, kind of uh, reduce their, uh, their velocity when they hit the ground? Um, so what factors affect drag when, when the, when the cat falls? Um, well, the, the shape, yeah. um, the, the, the size, uh, the velocity they're traveling at. Yeah, so the signal velocity, shape and size definitely play a role. So do you think cats are a lot more do they spread out? I think I think spreading out allows more air, mo air molecules kind yeah, of more so so, so, yeah, more so, so. Okay, that could be a factor. So let's focus on the hitting the ground bit that does that cause the most damage. So um could you explain using some physics, you know, like to to explain why cats take most damage or can fall from greater heights? Um some physics. Is it, is it something to do with terminal velocity, maybe? Um, well, terminal velocity only really is relevant at very big heights. So, say, so for a very high tower, hundred meters tall. So, um, think about the actual collision itself. What relevant physics is um, applicable to collisions? I'm uh, thinking conservation of momentum. Okay, so momentum. I just want momentum, yeah? Yeah. Um, so, do you want to offer some ideas about that? So, oh, momentum, right. So I'm thinking of car crash collisions. Yeah. And then like, we, we wear seatbelts mm -hmm. and airbags kind of increase the time taken for the change of momentum. 
it reduces the force on us. Yeah. So maybe it has to do something similar. So I would actually increase the time for them to change their momentum. Um, so so they have to make the collision between them and the floor slightly longer. I'm not, I'm not sure how they can do that. It's just, um, So first of all, we will probably we will probably uh, land on our legs, right? Right. Whereas cats do more. Oh, they land on all fours. Yeah. So they kind of. Oh, uh, okay. So spread out yeah. the yeah. force. Yeah. yeah. Spread their force out on all four legs. What else about their their legs on their mats? You see. Oh, they also bend down as well. Yeah. So 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 they go go straight and then they bend down. Yeah. So what does that do? It kind of makes it kind of ensures that all the all the force is not. Just like concentrating at your knees, but right? instead of just goes to the ground. Yeah, but more generally using like what you talking about podcasting. Oh, I guess that also kind of increases the time taken. Yeah, like, so that, that's language. like a major factor, increasing the, increasing the time taken. Remember, impulse is FT, so oh, yeah. um, as but, T is longer at this point. Yeah, but what I'm wondering is, uh, but I, I'm, when we fall as well, like, like, we also bend our knees, so I'm, so I'm still confused by like, why cats don't. Take as much damage. Well, evolution. Uh, if you look at evolution, cats are much more active in the world than we are. They are more prone, or they fall from greater heights more. Oh yeah. So they are practicing quickly. Uh, you know, being able to do the smooth movement. Whereas we don't have that practice. So when we land, we often don't react until like we actually hit the ground, and and then when we bend our legs, then at that point it's too late. Right. Okay. So it might be like a, like an instinct, like a pre-programmed behavior. Yeah, to cats. exactly. Because cats fall from uh, quite high heights a lot of the time. Right. Good. So let's park those ideas there and we'll move on to um, some protein synthesis. So do you want to outline protein synthesis today? Okay, protein synthesis. So, so proteins are made by, by the transcription and translation from DNA. So, it's so protein synthesis starts with starts inside the nucleus. where you have got the DNA uh, of a particular gene, uh, and then RNA polymerase sort of starts the whole process. Um, uh, and then you get uh, an mRNA strand, and then you have lots of like chopping off of the mRNA strand, so like getting rid of the exons, introns, you're getting rid of the introns, keeping the exons, and then and making an mRNA strand, which then goes to uh, which then leaves the um, uh, the nucleus via a, a nuclear pore, then goes to your ribosome uh, in the endoplasmic reticulum, and then it's translated by a tRNA. Um, so sort of complementary um, pairing of codons, so triplets of bases um, and anticodons, and then you get amino acids, which then join together by a peptide mix, and then you get a protein. Okay, so. You get a polypeptide that falls into a protein. Right. Why does this occur? Okay, so you've got the primary structure of the amino acids. Yeah. Um, and then if you think about the secondary structure, there's like uh, hydrogen, hydrogen bonding, and like different interactions between. Um, uh, I mean, I, I know um, you've got the NH2 uh, group of amino acids and the composite acid group. Might have hydrogen bonding between different amino acids for that, mm -hmm. and then that might cause some. That might cause some like shapes to be more stable than others. So that's why it kind of falls on itself. And also the tertiary structure. So the well, ionic bonding between different uh, R groups, um, and might have disulfide bridges, um, hydrophobic hydrophilic interactions, things like that. Okay, so you're talking about these interactions. Um, why do they form specifically in those places? So, for example, hydrogen bonds could form between really any two amino acids. So, why why do you get these alpha helices where you get these regular formation of hydrogen bonds? For example, um, well, 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 that might be true. So, so, you might have like a, a hydrogen bond between two different uh, amino acids, which are which are not enough for helices or basically to cheat. But it might be that um, that because you made the hydrogen bond form, the hydrogen bond form, it's more likely to break because it's uh, not in the most stable combination. 
because uh, because I, I mean I think that um, when a protein fold, there's only one ideal stable conformation mm -hmm. uh, that protein should have. Otherwise, it will probably be non-functional yeah. if there are multiple conformations. So it might be that um, that this sort of regular structure is the only way to uh, to have the most stable structure uh, out of any other protein. Why is it the most stable structure for um, native fold? Why is the native fold the most stable? Um, well, is this something to do with evolution? So, um, no, I'm not. I'm not looking for too complicated an answer. Just in general terms, why is it? The, why is it the most stable? Because it has. Because it's in the lowest energy state. Yeah, and and what does being in the lowest energy state mean? Um, what does it mean? It means that. It, uh, it means has, it, it sort of has the, the least energy, it sort of released all this energy and uh, yeah, it, it sort of had the, has the least potential energy it can. Yeah, so essentially um, the most, the greatest free energy change. Greatest free energy to go right. from the polypeptide to the native state. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the greatest, oh, it's like Gibbs free energy. Yeah. Right, so, so the rate has changed to go to the most stable structure. Yeah. Okay. And um, there's a bit of a conundrum here. So have you heard of entropy before? Uh, I've, I've heard a bit about it in physics. So do you know what it is? Can you define it? Yeah, it's something along the lines of uh, that everything in the universe goes to like a higher entropy state where things just get more random. Yeah, so there's a, a rule that says that everything has to become, well, systems tend to go from a more ordered state to a more chaotic state. Yeah. And why does protein folding uh, seem to have a conundrum, uh, uh, a uh, conflict with this uh, rule? Okay, so if, I think, if we're talking about things going from ordered to more random, then I guess the the folding of protein in itself is going from sort of more random amino acid chain to a specific shape. Yeah. So that that appears to kind of go against the law. Yeah. So why uh, it seems that entropy is decreasing. Yeah. And we know that entropy must increase. Yeah. So how how can this even happen? Uh, well, I, I don't think this is just an exception to the law, because uh, I don't think it makes uh, much sense. Um, it might be that, that um, the sort of, so, so because you're going from uh, a high sort of energy to a low energy state, and you're releasing that sort of, uh, you're releasing heat energy because you're forming ionic bonds, hydro bonds, that sort of thing, uh, which is more stable. So Heat energy is released, so maybe that heat energy is sort of big enough to overcome uh, overcome that change in entropy. So, so like maybe like the net entropy increasing. Yeah, that's a good idea. So, uh, one is about heat energy being released, so that increases the kinetic energy of the molecules, right? Yeah. What else? So, think about hydrophobic hydrophilic groups. Okay, so in protein folding, we've got. Uh, so the protein will naturally assume a shape which has hydrophobic groups on the inside mm -hmm. and hydrophilic groups on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really sure how, how that's to do with entropy. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, so uh, think about when you have a chain, Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, hydrophilic groups that are bonded to water, right? Yeah, water, yeah. And, you, and not all of the hydrophilic groups will be on the outside, obviously. You have some hydrophilic groups facing the inside to yeah. stabilize the contraction. Oh, okay. Oh, so it might be all oh, right. So think about the actual cellular environment, pretty it is. So, uh, so before you've got the hydrophilic groups, which have just sort of bonded to water, and then 
you know, or once you actually make the trade because some of those uh, some of those groups are slightly on the inside. Uh, you might actually break those bonds of water. So when previously water was sort of in a fixed state, there's always ones who can now uh, uh, can now escape. So so that might kind of increase randomness. Yeah. So you got you got the hydrophilic groups that bond with water. Now they are buried and they are now not exposed to water. So you get lots of uh, lots more water molecules being sort of liberated, and that allows you to have the positive increase in entropy. Yes. So that allows for it to occur. Very good. So to finish off uh, the interview, I'll show you a graph. So uh, have a look at this graph okay. and um, tell me what you make of it. Okay, so the graph has log 10 number of cells versus time. Um, and so it sort of spots off flat and then it goes up uh, and then it goes increasing as well plateaus and goes down. And there's something called the death phase also uh, written. So um, it looks like maybe the number of cells in a particular tissue. Um, so it starts with a number of cells and then that goes up a lot because before the log scale and that sort of plateaus. And then when, when the tissue dies, the number of cells falls. Is there something to do with that? Um, yeah. So. Not, not necessarily tissue cells, but maybe bacteria or yeast cells that oh. are in a culture, and you and and then you record the number of cells over time. How would you actually record uh, things from? So cells? we use something called optical density. So we shine a light through it. Yeah. Um, you determine through the feedback uh, the the amount of cells. Do you have like a calibration process? Oh, okay. So it's so similar to how like a colorimeter works. Uh, yeah, so same, same, similar principles, I guess. Um, why do you think we use a log scale? Uh, well, if it's a normal scale and we're working with really big numbers, then, then the graph will be kind of misleading, uh, kind of, or at least um, be a bit more inconvenient uh, in terms of the axes, uh, because the graph will be so, so large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you won't be able to fill the data. Yeah. Uh, Good. Um, why? What kind of affects the uh, growth phase here? Um, so, what affects the increasing number of cells? Well, the resources the cell uh, the cells have, I think, would be the main issue. So, whether the cells have enough, you know, protein, lipids, uh, and energy for mitosis. Okay. So let's say we have um, so yeast cells grown in a culture with glucose okay. and all the other uh, source traits are equal amounts. And then we have another um, culture growing on sucrose. How would you expect the graph to be different? So both cell, both cultures have the same amount of other nutrients, but it's just one has glucose and the other has sucrose, but the concentration is the same. Okay, so I don't think anything osmotic is something that is mentioning the same concentration. Um, so glucose is used for aerobic respiration. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the enzymes kind of break down glucose and make ATP, which is then used for other uh, other things. And, and in this case, also mitosis, because mitosis is a process that you need energy for. Uh, if you have sucrose, um, I, I I'm not sure if uh, if yeast cells can actually use sucrose for aerobic respiration to make energy. Um, because the sucrose is sort of, I can't remember if it's a five or six sort of carbon and sugar, but it definitely has a different shape to glucose. And I mean that enzymes in sort of uh, aerobic respiration, so glycolysis, uh, electron transport chain, I'm not sure if yeast have much from it, but electron transport chain, uh, it might be that, um, that, that's, uh, that the enzymes in this process are not specific to glucose because they've got a different. Uh, substrate shape. Could be. Uh, and now I mean the number of cells kind of, kind of plateaus earlier, or, or, or may, maybe even stays flat. Is the whole thing. So, what kind of what kind of saccharide is sucrose? Uh, is it a monosaccharide? It's a disaccharide. Disaccharide. Oh, 
Mikas and it's fructose. Yeah, Mikas and fructose. Glucose, fructose right. So let's imagine yeast does have an enzyme that hydrolyzes glucose and fructose. Now can you compare the two? Okay, so so you've got glucose, but you also got fructose. Uh, I'm not sure if yeasts are able to to metabolize fructose, but um, okay. So let's say if they weren't able to metabolize fructose, then the graphs would be exactly the same, um, maybe because you've got the same number of glucose in both um, inside both cells. Because except we've got uh, more fructose um, in uh, in the in the uh, agar plate, which has the sucrose solution. In. So maybe maybe the fructose uh, might be beneficial in some way, or 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 maybe it has a negative effect, like uh, like a uh, like an osmotic effect, maybe uh, over time. Um, but I, I do think it's actually pretty similar. Okay. Now let's focus on this opening uh, flat phase. Why why is there opening flat phase where cells don't increase in number? Um. Well, I mean. That it, it just takes time for interface, so to multiply the DNA and get all the resources to actually divide in the first place. Yeah, it could be. It's also to do with um, the substrate you're metabolizing. So, what's the difference between metabolizing glucose and metabolizing glucose? Um, how 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 are these substrates used differently? How are they used differently? Um, well, glucose. Uh, I mean, glucose is used in aerobic respiration, mm -hmm. but but sucrose you have to first break. Apart. Yeah, you're gonna hydrolyze it first. Yeah, you have to hydrolyze it before you use it for anything. So, do you think the lag phase will be different? The initial lag phase. Uh oh yeah. Um, so if you go back to what I said earlier, so finding enough energy to actually find in the first place, because you need to hydrolyze. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so you really have to hydrolyze sucrose, and that needs energy because you're breaking bonds. Um, it might mean that the, the, the lag phase is greater uh, mm -hmm. before actually the increase in the cells. Okay. And let's say the um, yeast cells can use fructose, then how will the growth phase be different? Um, it might be that the, but the growth phase happens uh, a lot quicker. So. In terms of the gradient of the graph, uh, be a lot steeper, mm -hmm. and it might be that uh, the actual plateau point will also be greater because you've got more energy. Well, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how much greater? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't, well, maybe roughly double if the energy reaction factor is similar to glucose. So double up here. Um. Ah oh, no. Because this is a log graph, right? Mm. Uh, okay, so it would be exactly double. It would be uh, log. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, log two, lib two, and um, log log two times greater. Does that make sense? So you've got log to the base ten of two x. Yeah, and you can use log rules to break that down. Yeah, so let me write this down. So, 2x. Okay, so that's log 10, 2 plus log 10. Oh, okay, so it'll be, so it'll be log 2 higher. Yeah. Right, not, not, not twice. Yeah. yeah, good. Okay, we've come to the end of our questions. Uh, the questions I've, I wanted to ask or, or ask you all of them. So now is the chance for you to ask some questions. Um, Okay, uh, well, because of uh, COVID-19 this year, uh, I'm wondering uh, what uh, what you're planning uh, in terms of how you're going to teach students next year. Okay, so COVID-19 is rapidly evolving, but we're, on, we're, we're keeping on top of all the updates. And I can tell you now, um, the practicals and all those right. will likely be in person because it's important that you actually do those. But the lectures uh, that will be confirmed closer to the time when we have more uh, knowledge to make decisions. Okay. Uh, I don't have any more questions. Okay. Thanks. So that's all my questions. So you're free to go okay. for um, the future. Thanks.
Okay, good job on making it to the end of that video. It was definitely a long interview by Oxbridge standards. And now I'll provide some feedback on Kushik's performance. So, some things to bear in mind before I do that. Firstly, I've known Kushik for 7 years, and I've also done plenty of mock interviews with him. So, in the actual thing, you'll be doing an interview with someone you've probably never met before, and so there's that difference there, obviously. The second thing is that I'm obviously no admissions tutor or qualified academic, well, yet, hopefully. And so, the way I've conducted this interview is merely reflective of what I see the interview experience to be like based on what my interview was like. So now we'll dive straight into the interview. Uh, feedback. So on the whole, his performance was very, very good. Very little to fault. The only minor things were perhaps maybe that he was a bit nervous at the start. And that's fine because he got confident throughout, more confident throughout. And I think most people start off nervous anyway, so there's nothing to worry about there. The second thing was sometimes he went off on something that wasn't um, wasn't really relevant or that I didn't really consider to be the right answer. And that's also fine. The interviewer might have a set solution they want you to get to and they'll give you hints to get to it. And he did manage to get to it at the end. Now, straight into the interview feedback then. For the first question on his EPQ, he answered that very well. I think his body language displayed his passion um, and the interview is like nothing more than you talking about what you uh, has researched with a lot of passion because that's what they do uh, every day. Now, the second part about the nervous system and the brain, I think he was very good at explaining how he approached the question and what his method was. And that's really helpful to the interviewer, so they can help you and understand what you're doing. He also subtly shows of his knowledge. I don't know if you noticed, but he uh, mentions as an aside uh, about glial cells, oligodendrocytes, things like that. And that gives the interviewer an idea of how much above and beyond what you've been doing without being excessively arrogant or going on some tangent, which is unrelated to the question. And lastly, he's very good at being confident and defending his own ideas. So when I question him about how reasonable his estimates are, he defends them and he thinks they're reasonable. And sometimes interviewers just want to see how, how much you stand by your ideas. So when they question you, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong. Maybe they just want to hear you justify uh, your reasoning. For the cat question, I thought he was willing to take on my hints very well, so he went on about um, something different and I prompted him with momentum, which promptly led him to move on to the right answer, the answer I was expecting. And he also stays very calm in that process, so he doesn't panic when he doesn't get to the right answer straight away. And I don't know if you noticed, but he also subtly uh, shares his passion in a slightly different way so he asked the question back to me and that shows that he's engaged with what we're talking about he's actually interested and that's something the interviewer really likes for the next question uh about entropy he also deals with the new concept of entropy very well so there he pretended he didn't know about entropy um he hadn't studied it before and that's fine so the interviewer will teach you about it it's just to see how teachable you are and for the last question about the graph, uh, he does a process of elimination, so he talks about which processes can't be happening. For example, uh, you may remember he talks about how there's no consideration of the osmotic effect here because that wasn't relevant. And that's sometimes a good way to approach the question, it helps to narrow down your different ideas and helps the interviewer to uh, guide you to the right idea and help you refine your ideas as well. So that's the end of my feedback. If you haven't watched the interview video we uploaded recently, that will be linked below, as well as the interview document. And all that's left for me to say is good luck for your interview preparation and your actual interview whenever that comes around.